Yeah, okay, should be fine now. So should we slowly start? I guess people are still joining, but uh, uh, if you are ready, we can uh, we can start with a small introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. And um, it's uh, my great pleasure today to introduce you Amanda Prorok. So Amanda is a professor at uh, the Department of Computer Science at the University of Cambridge. Uh, before joining Cambridge, she was also with the University of Pennsylvania, where she did her postdoc, and uh, she completed her PhD studies at PFL in the Department of Computer Science, and we're very proud of that. Uh, she has got multiple awards, including the ERC Starting Grant, an Amazon Research Award, and many more research awards. Her PhD thesis was also awarded with the ABB Prize. Uh, that is one of the most prestigious prizes for EPFL thesis at, um, for thesis at EPFL. So today she will be working about graph neural networks for multi-agent learning. And um, thanks, Amanda, and uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Darina, for the uh, very kind introduction and invitation to talk at your uh, seminar series today. It's a real pleasure. So um, I'd like to begin my talk with um, a proposition that all intelligence is actually collective intelligence. And this actually builds on an impressive work uh, by scientists uh, who have been showing that no matter at what scale, there are processes where entities interact to satisfy some macroscopic properties. Um, for example, cells, they maintain anatomical homeostasis, organisms um, achieve template-free reconstruction of severed body parts, and groups of organisms and animals um, exploit collective intelligence for information gathering, energy efficiency, and so on and so and so on and so forth. And so, one of the reasons why collective intelligence has captured um, our imagination for so long is because they're adaptive, they're resilient, um, and they're efficient. And all of this is achieved at relatively low cost in a somewhat emergent manner. So um, it turns out that these qualities really matter as we progress to developing ever more complex engineered systems of embodied agents. Um, for example, we're considering vehicles, interacting with other vehicles, robots, forming teams to solve hard problems um, that are spatially distributed. And these kinds of things are actually already happening. And we're really seeing how these embodied agents are becoming pervasive, um, pervasively deployed, and they're connected, right? And so I'm talking about robots and embodied agents that are helping us distribute resources, um, automating transport, um, and helping us broadly really respond to the challenges of urbanization, dense living, and also environmental change. So this kind of frames a little bit of um, the research motivation behind a lot of the things that we do. And it's underpinned by the research question or the, the broader um, um, challenge of, how to achieve collective behavior. And so we like to think about the methods for collective systems in three respective categories, um, which also informs us about how we might approach finding algorithms or algorithmic solutions to the problem of collective intelligence. And so what we can see here is um, what I call the three C's of collective systems. So coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. And we consider these different interaction mechanisms dis as distinct ways of interacting. So in coordination, we look at problems such as coverage, um, where the, um, the gains in adding additional agents to the systems um, are at most linear, so uh, sublinear gains. Because agents have their local incentives, and they're basically just getting out of each other's way in order to satisfy some um, higher order problem. In the middle, we have cooperation, which can achieve super additive gains, but um, this super additive gain may depend on a threshold effect. So um, considering traffic examples, um, for example, it's only after a certain threshold number of vehicles who are cooperating exists that you can actually reap the benefits of this cooperative um, paradigm. And then on the right-hand side, we have collaboration, where we're looking at heterogeneous or complementary agents where per performance improves as the number of species or types of agents increases. And we're really leveraging the fact that they have unique capabilities. So those are the three C's of collective systems. 
and it helps us organize our algorithmic solutions. Now, the research problem behind all of this is actually solving the three Cs is hard. And the core of what we do is understand how to design practical methodology for effective um, collective systems. So why is it a hard problem? And I'd like to introduce this to you. So first reason it's hard is um, most coordination problems cannot be actually solved um, to optimality in polynomial time. So there exist hardness results that underpin um, these insights. Second of all, um, they are hard because it's often not clear what strategy to follow um, when we decentralize our systems and we're facing partially observable um, information structures. Partial observability requires communication or some form of interaction if optimal actions require a notion of glo global state space representation at individual agents, uh, within individual agents decision-making processes. And the decision of how to communicate with whom to communicate and how to disseminate knowledge um, is difficult to design um, in many cases. And the third problem is what happens when things don't go according to plan? So we need to um, design strategies that can accommodate to um, artifacts that happen in the real world, such as noise, delays, faults, and even tampering, such as malicious agents or agents that are non-cooperative um, that um, include their some, themselves as part of our systems. And so all of these things, we, we can approach them through first principles-based and model-based approaches, but it's difficult because it's it tends to be um, one design solution per application, whereas what we're interested in is a new paradigm that helps us address all of these problems in one. And um, what my lab has been doing for the last four or five years is really looking into how we can leverage data-driven approaches in order to help us solve these kinds of problems. So my research agenda is guided by this overarching question of can robots or can um, autonomous agents learn to coordinate? And we're fueled by the simple insight that agent relationships can be represented as graphs. And we're going to exploit the structure of um, underlying data, which is given to us through this graph topology proxy to facilitate the learning problem. So ultimately what we want to do is we want our agents to be able to learn what to communicate and how to uh, process incoming, inf incoming information to make decisions based on the messages they have received. Yeah. So I'm now going to start introducing to you how we think about um, this problem. So we begin by considering how um, we can model the interaction between two agents. So in other words, how does the observation of an agent J affect the action or decision of another robot or another agent um, I? Okay? And so what we're interested in understanding is how do we represent um, an interaction feature? Here I'm, I'm not noting this is Z sub J, how this interaction feature is processed um, or created in the first instance and in the second instance, how it's processed by an agent I and how does agent I then use this um, interaction feature to make a decision about what it's going to do next or what its action is going to be, okay? So this is how we represent the general methodology. And what's interesting to us is that we can generalize this methodology to any number of N agents or N robots that happen to be in the neighborhood of the acting agent um, A sub I or robot I. Um, and what we change is from what I showed you before in the prior slide is simply now that we have some means of aggregating these incoming interaction features from my neighbors. Okay? And this is what's going to allow us to generalize to an arbitrary number of agents. Um, and, and so we can now formalize this methodology by creating a graph abstraction where we consider the agents as nodes in this graph. And the connections here simply represent the interaction topology. Okay? So important to note at this point is that the graph topology is the proxy for the interaction topology. And we're implicitly inducing an inductive bias on our learning architecture by considering this graph topology. Okay? Um, the robot I, what it does is then it's modeling these interactions through hidden features H sub I, which is the result of a function phi. 
um, that processes these incoming features in a permutation equivariant manner. And this permutation equivariance um, property here is actually important to us because the order of the incoming features should have no um, impact on how the income, how the um, acting robot makes a decision on what to do. Okay. And so what I'm showing you here, this formalism, is a kind of a general formalism that is meant to capture the various flavors of graph neural networks um, that we know today, including attention networks and message passing networks, as well as graph convolutional um, neural networks. But um, maybe to make this a little bit more concrete, as an example, um, let's have a look at how, how we would instantiate this no notation or this formalism. Um, within the framework of graph convolutional um, networks, which were one of the first um, to, to really be studied in depth and proposed um, by the community. And so what we're looking at here is um, uh, an instantiation of the GCN, where we, we, we get to this um, simplification or this reduction of the formalism by assuming that we have a sum aggregation scheme. Okay, So the incoming information is being summed up. And our interaction topology is represented by an adjacency matrix um, denoted by A here. And we can thus conveniently write this in matrix form. And as, as, as we look at the right hand side of this equation here, we perceive this with our nonlinearity. Um, and the sum internally is um, over our number of communication hops. A is our adjacency matrix, Z is our matrix of interaction features. And W is now um, exposing the parameters of our neural network that we're going to try to learn. That essentially will then tell us how to process incoming and send outgoing information. Okay. So this is how we um, um, get to the formulations or the methodology that allow us um, to model these interaction between agents. So um, what is interesting to us is that this whole methodology can now be used to not only model interaction, but actually synthesize the interaction. And you can see this graph neural network as a way to create differentiable communication channels, essentially learning what the robots are going to be communicating to one another, right? Um, so ultimately we want the robots to be sampling actions from these um, policies, from these um, policy distributions that are being um, conditioned on observations from its neighboring robots. And these neighboring robots are going to be broadcasting encodings of their local observations over a communication channel. And what we do is we learn the interaction strategy by propagating our gradients back through this communication channel. And this essentially does two things for us. Well, on the first hand side, it defines how the outgoing information is encoded by this function that I'm denoting through f, right? f processes the observations. And it also decides and defines how the incoming information is being processed. And that's the phi um, that I'm representing here. Okay. So this is how we synthesize our policies and how I were, were representing um, this whole scheme as a differentiable communication um, strategy. So how is this useful to us? And why are we so interested in this in, in the community of multi-agent systems? So I'm going to represent this um, through um, this um, graphic here. Um, Learning communication is interesting to us for several reasons. Um, what we're looking at here is a scheme or a plot where on the vertical axis, what we're doing is we're increasing the ability to deal with practical partial information problems that occur in the real world. And on the x-axis horizontally, what we're doing is we're increasing the scale of our solvable problems, um, be it by increasing the complexity of our systems or by increasing the number of agents that are involved. On the, in, this, in the regime where we have small problems with full observability, we actually know how to solve these problems to optimality quite efficiently and successfully. For one um, common example in the multi-agent systems um, domain are multi-agent pathfinders. So solvers for these kinds of problems exist. Um, they are optimal and complete, and they do perform very well and very efficiently for systems that aren't um, very large and for which we know all information a priori. Okay, So these are solved in batch. So this box is done. We know how to do this. Um, the next box I'm showing you here are, are problems in the large scale regime, but for which we assume full observability. TSP or vehicle routing problems are instances of this, um, of this problem class. And we have very effective solutions to this because the heuristics that we developed to solve these kinds of problems are highly specialized and very effective. So these problems as well, we consider um, solved. 
In the highly partial observable regime, but for smaller problems, which we want to be able to small online um, and quickly, um, we, we lean on literature from uh, from the POMDP um, um, domain, so partially observable mark of, mark of decision processes. And these solutions also work and solve the problems to optimality, but due to complexity, only perform really well um, for smaller systems. So we're not really able to do this at scale yet. So I'm now getting to what we're really interested in. And what we're interested in is being able to solve problems where the configuration space is highly dimensional um, due to the complexity of the problem of the number of agents involved, where frequent replanning might be needed. And we want to solve, satisfy global objectives, but we must rely on non-centralized means of information dissemination um, and interagent interactions. So those are the constraints. And hopefully replanning is, is successful in the sense that it provides us with adaptability and the kind of resilience that we want to see as we deploy systems into the real world. So designing solutions for this orange box is hard and difficult and doing this at scale through hand design methods is is, is, is not practical. And that's why we're looking into data-driven methods in order to address these kinds of um, problems. And so I'm gonna begin by introducing um, one example that we did a couple of years back that addresses um, um, this kind of, of problem. And so the research question that, we're, uh, that we brought up here in order to develop our first data-driven solution to this kind of problem is the question of can we somehow develop solutions that often automatically synthesize local communication and decision-making policies for problems that are very hard to solve in the coordination domain. Um, and we're gonna to try to do this using graph neural networks and a data-driven approach. So the reason that we're actually interested um, in this problem um, is, and, and oh, I forgot to mention, we're going to be applying this research question to the multi-agent pathfinding domain. And why this is interesting to us is because multi-agent pathfinding is NP, um, is NP hard for both make span as well as flow time objectives. And the second reason we're interested in, in applying this to multi-agent pathfinding is because we know that optimal solvers exist. And for us, the, the consequence of this is that we can uh, not only use these optimal solvers to try to copy them, but in the, the small data regime, in the small um, number of agent regime, we can use the solutions of the optimal solvers to benchmark the solutions we're going to be getting through our data-driven approaches. So for us, this creates a very good starting ground for trying for starting to develop data-driven solutions to solve these kinds of problems and validate whether or not our methodology is even amenable to this kind of problem. So how do we set this up? So what does the multi-agent pathfinding problem actually even consider? So it considers a group of agents that are randomly initialized in an environment. They are all designed, um, they all have designated destinations. Each agent has to reach a specific goal. Um, but the agents don't know where that goal is. They don't know where they're located. So we don't assume that they have any positioning information whatsoever. They only have a relative direction to the goal that they have been assigned to. And they only have local visibility of their field. So if we look at this um, little schema here, agent four can see everything that's inside the green box. It can communicate with agents that are in its vicinity. So agents eight, 10, and number one. Um, and it can see any other obstacles or any other agents that are within its field of view. Okay? And the only thing that um, this agent is going to leverage, um, aside from its local field of view, is communication to neighboring agents. So what we want to do is we want this agent to learn a policy that exploits this purely local information, yet is able to, to, to satisfy the problem specification, which is reach your destination, um, with a performance that is comparable to what we would be able to achieve with a centralized near with a centralized optimal solver. Okay, um, so that is our goal. Yet, how we want to go beyond this is we want to be able to scale much more gracefully as we increase the scale of our system. So, inc including more and more agents in larger and larger environments, bringing the optimal solvers to a breaking point in terms of um, computational um, requirements. And so this is the challenge that we're setting ourselves. So how do we set up the problem? We set it up um, in the following manner. So we have this um, machine learning pipeline that is um, composed of three main components, where for each agent, we input a tensor that records um, local information, which consists of the observation, other agents, and the goal projection. 
This information is then encoded by a convolutional neural network, um, and the graph neural network then emulates the communication by computing how information is sent and received among agents. And the output is then fed into a sequence of fully connected layers, um, and the robot's a motion decision is then the result of a final softmax activation layer, um, since we're considering discrete uh, motion primitives for this uh, particular um, system in question. So the problem formulation um, here, um, mathematically put, is as follows. So what I want to do here is I just want to convince you that the parameters that we're learning actually lead to decentralizable policies that can be, um, at the end of the day, executed locally on individual agents. But we do start with a centralized formulation, and this is practical because the training of our systems happens in a centralized form. So let's look at the first equation here. So if we assume that S is my adjacency matrix and X is um, a matrix that gathers the observations from all the agents, then the first equation is telling me how an agent I aggregates the information that is being sent to it over a number um, capital K communication hops. And the second equation then parametrizes this message aggregation by right multiplying the observations with the matrix, matrix H, which is our learnable um, uh, set of parameters. And if we have multiple communication hops, we have a bank of these um, of filters, um, and we, we call this set of um, learnable parameters theta sub 2. Okay. Um, and that is um, how we set up our problem. And we're, we're simply going to use um, the abbreviation um, for this whole uh, communication function by calling um, it G or by noting G as, as our communication function and, and um, set it to theta sub two are the parameters of this communication function. So now recall that we also have a CNN and, and an MLP in our pipeline, and we're going to learn these three modules in an end-to-end -end manner within an imitation learning setup where we're um, trying to copy an optimal solver because we know these optimal solvers exist. And we're going to be minimizing a cross entropy loss function that um, considers optimal discrete actions that are performed by our expert algorithm. So this optimal solver that we're going to borrow from the multi-agent pathfinding community. So this is how we set up the learning problem. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to I'm going to show you how this centralized formulation actually leads to decentralizable policies that we can execute locally on any individual agent. So if we look at how the architecture presents itself locally, um, if we focus on agent B, this is what um, it boils down to. So the front end here is straightforward. It's basically just our convolutional neural network that encodes the local information that is being observed or gathered by any individual agent. Um, the individual agent is then processing this and, and, and creating this local feature vector X sub B. And the agent B then shares this local um, feature vector with all its neighboring um, agents. In this case, it's sending it to agent A. Um, agent A then receives this information and does something with it. Okay? Um, and what we're going to do next is we're actually going to focus on agent A and see what agent A actually ends up doing with this information that it's receiving from, from agents B and C. So locally, what agent A does is nothing else than also compute its local feature vector, so H, um, X sub A. And um, it's going to be um, then um, passing this uh, or multiplying this feature vector X sub A with its own local um, GNN matrix, so H sub zero, that accounts for how it's supposed to be processing its information at hop zero, which is essentially itself, so the local agent. Um, and the other things that agent A is going to be doing is it's going to be aggregating all the other messages um, for each individual communication hop. So at hop one, it's going to be aggregating the messages through a simple sum um, equation from um, agents B and C and multiplying that um, aggregated feature vector by the matrix H sub, uh, H sub one. So this summed up information across all hops is then also, um, uh, so that hop one is then summed up with hop zero and all the information summed up across all the different hops is then passed through a nonlinearity producing a X prime sub A um, that is then fed into our MLP, and that then outputs our final action, which is a discrete motion primitive telling the agent whether it has to move up, down, left, or right, or stay idle. So in conclusion here, you can see that all the operations that need to be computed by the GNN can be decentralized. 
Um, and this is very practical because we are no longer, by, by decentralizing the decision-making policy for this problem here, we're no longer depending on N for computational complexity of solving this problem due to its decentralized form. And so next up, I'm going to show you some movies that demonstrate the performance of this uh, decentralized planning algorithm with um, counterpart optimal centralized planning algorithms. So on the left-hand side, you can actually see um, an example of such an optimal algorithm. So this is um, an instance of, of CBS. So that's the name of this expert algorithm. And I know that a lot is going on here in this movie, um, but qualitatively, what you see happening is that on the right-hand side, that's our solution. Um, and on the left-hand side, we have relatively similar motion patterns. And what is most interesting to us is both systems complete at the same time, roughly. So our solution, which is running in a fully decentralized manner where each agent is acting only based on local information and information that is incoming through um, communication from other agents, is almost as good as what we could do in a fully centralized pre-planned solution with full observability. And this is really great because we're, we're suddenly running systems where in, in O of one, where the left-hand side system runs with a, it is actually NP hard to solve um, in the number of agents. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this from a quantitative um, point of view. Um, what we can see here is uh, we're comparing our models with a couple of benchmarks. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at how successful our method is for varying number of, of agents. And on the right-hand side, we're seeing how quick it, it actually, how, how fast or how efficient the solutions are that we're producing. So in terms of success rate, we're almost at 100% throughout um, different team sizes, um, especially as we consider larger hop count numbers. So the more information and agents are receiving, the higher the likelihood um, that we're reach reaching 100% success. And I'd like to note here that our success metric is actually quite stringent in the sense that Success equals one if all of the agents reach their predefined destinations. And if only one of the agents doesn't reach um, its, desi its desi designated destination, that counts as an, a failure. So it's a very tough metric. Um, and on the right-hand side, we're seeing how the flow time increase, so lower is better, is very low for the systems where we're considering two or three hop counts. Uh, two or three hops of information passing in, in our multi-agent systems. Um, and this is great because it shows us that not only are we completing our, our problems um, nearly always, but we're very close to the best possible performance we could achieve. And we know this is the best possible because we're comparing it with optimal solvers. Yeah. Now, you'll have noticed that our x-axis stops us at, at 12 agents, which is actually quite small in terms of how large we could be going. And the reason for this is that our benchmarks, um, or especially the flow time graph, is being computed by comparing it to optimal solvers. And optimal solvers um, don't complete for large systems. So that's what's limiting us in this analysis here. But what we really want to do with our system is actually be able to scale to systems of much greater size. And just to give you an, um, a kind of a back of the envelope um, idea of of what we're actually able to do here with optimal solvers. So for this particular instance, if we're looking at um, systems of, of 40 to 50 agents, CBS, so one of the most um, effective um, solvers for this kind of problem, doesn't, isn't able to produce a solution within our, within our 10 minute timeout. So you can see already how an ordinary desktop um, solver is not able to produce these kinds of solutions for which we're now able to run our systems in fully decentralized form and compute us um, with a worst case complexity of O of one because it's decentralized. And that's where um, the magic comes in. And that's why we're so excited about these kinds of decentralized um, solutions to these kinds of problems. So we then started thinking about, well, our decentralized solutions are good, but we're starting to see a kind of a drop off of performance as we're scaling them to sizes or in problem instances um, that haven't been seen during training time. And we want to um, ensure that the generalizability of our solutions is actually maintained as we start scaling our problems to much larger and larger problem instances. And so we started thinking about, well, what is it that we need to do in order to ensure this um, generalizability or scalability of our system? Um, and so what we did is we said, well, what we need to be able to do is tell our agents to 
to learn to focus on only relevant information. And so we performed a very small modification of our GNN formulation by saying, well, we're going to pre-multiply our adjacency matrix with an attention matrix. So this um, symbol there is what corresponds to the Hadamard product, which, which is essentially being learned at the same time at the same time as our matrix H and allows the agents to learn as a function of egocentric information and incoming information, what agents they're going to be uh, paying attention to. And using this attention mechanism, we can see that we're now able to um, test our systems on a hundred times larger systems that have, that have ever been seen um, during training. So this is, um, is really interesting to us because we're now really starting to generalize beyond what has been seen and what can be solved through ex expert solvers. And so we're quite excited about this. So everything that I've shown you thus far has been on um, multi-agent systems that have been um, trained and executed in simulation. And what I'd like to show to you next is how we're thinking about transitioning these kinds of ideas and solutions to real world problems and what might be the challenges that we um, uh, encounter as we go from simulation to the real world. And in robotics, we call this problem sim to real. So what we're interested in here is um, if assuming we have a policy that has been trained in simulation, how do we enable a zero shot transfer of that GNN based policy to a real world problem? And what we want to do is we want to determine um, um, the real world conditions that might lead to issues. We want to identify the causes for these issues and hence be able to develop solutions that we then can implement as part of our methodology in order to enable a smooth transfer of our, of our um, policies. And we came up with a scenario, which is, um, I like to call it a make or break scenario, because it will break if it doesn't work and it'll manage and it'll succeed if the policies are robust enough. And it's a make or break scenario because we have agents that have to pass through a constriction to rejoin a predefined formation on the other hand side of a narrow passageway. If the agents fail in successfully communicating to, to coordinate through this narrow passageway, they will not be able to go through this passageway, they will not be able to negotiate the passageway, and they will not be able to rejoin their destinations on the other hand side. What's crucial here is that the, the, the agents have no other means of, of observing um, their relative positions, and they rely 100% on messages that are being communicated communicated amongst one another, hence putting a lot of pressure on the graph neural network to learn and perform adequately as we execute the system in the real world. What we did in our methodology in order to test the scenario is we designed a physical ablation analysis um, scheme where we go from an idealistic setup to a setup that is essentially what you'd encounter in the real world. And we move through throughout several steps in this system. So we go from, um, so this is all happening in the real world, but we start from a system um, that is centralized where all the policies are running on a centralized computer. The centralized computer um, computes all the actions, sends those actions to a router and the router then distributes those actions to um, robots. Okay? We then decentralize the computation. So we're now running um, multiple threads on a computer. The computer then um, uh, pipes those outcoming actions to a router and the router then distributes um, the, the action messages to the different agents, the different robots. And in the next step, we then cut out the centralized computer completely from our scheme, rerun all the policies locally on the agents, but we're still using the router um, to manage the communication network for us. And on the right-hand side, we have the most realistic real-world scenario, which is a fully decentralized ad hoc communication network, which relies on no computer, on no router, and uses purely point-to-point -point communication where the communication infrastructure is essentially um, a transceiver placed on board every robot individually, and the robots are um, communicating with one another in a fully decentralized um, and non, and so asynchronous manner. Okay, so no more artifacts that would in any way facilitate synchronization amongst robots um, as we could have done in simulation. So this is our physical ablation um, analysis. And what I'm showing you in this movie here as is how we overlay the performance of these different systems and the actual robots you're seeing here are running 
um, the real world a version of this. So in, um, running an ad hoc point-to-point -point communication network, and we're comparing the performance of what the robots are doing to the virtual overlays, which is what the simulation policies um, are predicting would be done were we to run this in simulation. Okay. So as this movie steps through, um, uh, we go through the various motions um, of, of our setup. So we train this in simulation and we get this idealistic behavior, assuming that communication runs in lockstep and is all synchronous and there's no delays, there's no faults. And um, the robots are able to successfully coordinate um, their motion. And then we move on um, uh, to testing that in, in the real world, but through the managed system. Um, and there you can see the managed system performing, being coordinated through a centralized um, computer. And then the last segment of this movie um, basically shows the decentralized uh, version of this where we remove all centralized components and any component that might be managing the system and everything is running locally and is managed by a point-to-point -point communication network. Um, and the good news here is that the system succeeds. So this make or break scenario, it turns out the robots manage. So we have uh, nearly 100% success in this, um, in this setup. We do, however, observe that there is a graceful performance degradation as we progress through this physical ablation analysis. And you can visually see it as the robots have a slight delay with respect to the virtual um, layovers. But the good news is, is that the GNN-based policy is robust. It's robust to any major shifts in distribution of communications from simulation to real, and we're still able to successfully solve the problem. So the last example I want to show you as I start um, um, coming to the end of my talk is a final real world um, problem that we, we tackled um, that also exploits graph neural network based coordination and communication in order to solve a problem that would otherwise be hard to solve with first principles model based um, solutions. And so the problem that we're trying to solve here is motiv motivated by scenarios where we want the robots to essentially see around corners. We want the robots um, to be able to see around, to see what they cannot see. And they, they'll, they're gonna be doing this by leveraging um, a sensor network of static agents that have sensors that communicate with one another and the robots to disseminate visual information about what is happening in a cluttered environment for which it is difficult for the robot by itself to um, create global representations in order for it to successfully be able to plan anything. And so um, the, key, the key challenge here is that we want this visual sensor network that we're going to be setting up to be essentially plug and play. So we want to set up the, the, the sensors in a way that um, allows us to move in and out of environments very seamlessly without having to calibrate neither their position um, nor let the robot know where these sensors are located. And it's all going to be inferred simply by the sensors communicating this visual information to one another and the robot, and them having learned how to merge and stitch this information together to create coherent representations of this env environment or workspace that the robots are operating in. And so this, this um, set up here is basically composed of a bunch of sensors with downwards facing um, cameras with fisheye lenses and a robot that can communicate with the sensor network um, to, to, under, to learn how to navigate around it in order to find a target, which is represented by um, a small green block that we place at random um, locations within this workspace. And we're gonna be training um, again in an end-to-end -end manner feature extractors, feature aggregators, and post-processors that are fed into the robot's um, decision-making policy that allows the robot to decide how it has to move through this environment in order to reach the target position as quickly as possible. So again, the architecture looks similar to what I showed you before, um, just that with a small difference that we're actually acting in the real world now. So um, we're, we're considering flattened omnidirectional images coming in, um, to any one of the sensors. Um, this is being processed by CNN. That information is fed into our GNN module. 
then post-process by an MLP, and that leads to an action that the robot has to uh, uses. So this 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 um, this action policy basically gives the robot a distribution over its motion primitives, and the robot then samples from this distribution to, to decide how it's going to move through the environment um, to proceed towards its target. Um, and our cost function is based on uh, imitation learning, where we consider a data set of discrete motion primitives for given observations, and we make predictions over what direction it's more, it's most promising for um, uh, the robot to move into in order to move into a direction that leads it, it to its path um, uh, on a path that is in, on, um, coherent with the shortest possible path to the target. Um, so what we actually do, because um, as any system, these uh, pipelines are very training or data sample um, intensive. So we train this whole pipeline in simulation. And the question then is, how do we transfer, transfer these policies to the real world where we now lo no longer have a flattened omnidirectional image from simulation, but are a flattened omnidirectional image from the real world? And despite the similarity of a simulator to the real world, this, these discrepancies are significant. And we have to teach our simulated policy how to deal with that. And we simply do so by adding a small module, which we call a, a real to sim translator that um, basically tries to minimize the difference of these two images in embedding space so that um, whatever the robot observes in the real world produces an embedding that the policy that was trained purely in simulation knows how to interpret and knows how to deal with. So we replace um, um, our, our CNN, which was previously trained with a CNN, which we call um, Phi hat now, that um, outputs this, this new embedding um, that is an embedding that approximates the embedding of what a simulated um, image would have produced in would the agent be acting in simulation? And with that, the whole back end of the pipeline can be exactly the same as what we got from our simulated um, training pipeline. And so this is really great for us because it means that we leverage the data efficiency of our simulation pipelines and only have to learn this very small bit, which is the real to sim translator. And with that, we can then directly transfer our policies to the real world and run our system um, on an actual agent um, that is then performing navigation in the real world. And so as I play this movie, you can see an example of how, so the bottom is a top-down view, um, and on the right-hand side, you can see what the individual sensors are seeing, and um, you can see a twin setup with the simulated environment and see what the simulated environment was predicting. Um, and so here you actually see images of what all the sensors are predicting. Um, and what, what's, what's happening under the hood is that the sensors are communicating with one another and through this um, enlarged receptive visual field are able to propagate directional information to the robot telling it in which direction it has to head at any given point in time so that the robot um, eventually is able to achieve the position of the target, which it had no idea where it was in the beginning because it was out of line of sight. And here you can see how adaptive the system is so we can um, move around objects, we can move around the target, and the sensor network is constantly reacting to this changed visual field and constantly telling the robot, oh, now you have to change direction because your target is now here or there, or you have a new obstacle, so you have to replan um, and so on and so forth. So it's very flexible, very adaptive, and quite robust to these kinds of changes. Um, and what's really interesting to us is, um, so here you can see um, this, uh, this overview from, from top-down view. What's interesting um, to us is, is also demonstrating how the sensors themselves don't need to know where they are. They don't have to be positioned at all in this environment. And we actually demonstrate that through an experiment where in the beginning, if no sensor can see the target, the robot doesn't know where to go. But you can simply pick up a sensor and then place it in the vicinity of a target. And you can see how that information is immediately um, sent across to the robot. Um, because it has now received information from at least one sensor that is within line of sight of, of the target, and it then progresses towards that target. And this is really cool because it means we have a now we, we now have a way of setting up sensor networks that are completely positioning and calibration free in environments where you need to reach targets that are completely out of line of sight from um, the acting agent. And see, these are just some results 
um, um, that demonstrate the, the, the paths that are taken before the sensors can see the targets, um, the, the robots aren't able to find it. And as soon as you move the sensor into a line of sight position within the target, the robot is able to navigate to it. Um, here are some more results that basically demonstrate how we reap uh, more and more improvement in terms of performance of these systems as we increase the communication range. So that's what I'm showing you on the left-hand side plot. Um, and on the right-hand side plot, I'm showing you what happens as we increase uh, the sensor network density. So the more sensors we have, the better performance also gets. So the y-axis here is uh, success weighted by path length, and one means we have 100% success and our paths are optimal, meaning we're, that the robot moved in the shortest possible path to the target. Um, and so overall, we're able to show that we have at least a 2x improvement in performance over systems that don't use communication um, in order to, to reach um, uh, their, their targets. This now um, basically concludes all the things that I wanted to show you in my talk today. And I just would like to conclude with a couple of um, take home messages um, and a couple of, of points that I'm excited about. So with this talk, I hope that I have convinced you how graph neural networks really facilitate the learning of decentralized policies in multi-agent systems. I've hopefully also been able to show you how these learned policies um, provide scalability at very little cost, and also how we're able to use these policies um, for real world problems where robots not, don't act in simulation, but actually in the real world where, where we have noisy situations um, and uh, imperfect conditions such as asynchronicity. A few things that I'm excited about with some upcoming and very new work is um, what we do when agents are heterogeneous. How can we think about further optimizing the environment to facilitate um, um, effective coordination? And finally, how do we guarantee interpretability and guarantees over these systems as we learn interaction um, schemes, schemes in uh, data-driven manners amongst agents? So with that, I would like to thank um, my collaborators, of which there are quite a few, also my funders, and finally, uh, a great thanks to my team um, who have uh, executed and performed all of the work that I have um, demonstrated to you today. And with that, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Many thanks, Amanda, for this very interesting talk. Um, yeah, let's start with questions from the audience. You could even unmute yourself if you want. Um, so I'll, I'll just ask a very quick question. This is outstanding, very interesting results. Um, in your models, uh, you have the communication between the agents as either communicating or not, correct? In other words, there isn't a, a physical layer type of model right. in, in the formulation. Yeah, yeah it's a great point. Um, really important and, and uh, that is actually one of the reasons we ran our systems in the real world how uh, to validate some of the assumptions um, that we're making but i appreciate i didn't actually explicitly mention the assumptions that we're making so the adjacency matrices that we um impose on our systems are defined by a disk model over communication so we assume that the robots have a limited communication range beyond which they cannot communicate it's an extremely simplified um, representation of what happens in the real world and is by no means representative of the real world but it facilitates the first step which is learning the communication patterns assuming you have a given um, connectivity neighborhood um, what happens then, and that is the tricky part for us, is we can use these policies, right? There is no, there's nothing holding us back from using these policies based on these assumed interaction schemes. But what happens as we then transition to the real world is the adjacency matrices that are effectively taking place don't correspond to the disk model. And this presents us with a distribution shift. And that is the distribution shift that we have to learn how to deal with as we transfer from sim to real. Um, and we've started scratching uh, the surface of this problem a little bit. We mainly are, are thinking about addressing a synchronicity and all of that, um, but, but dealing with you know, truly different um, communication patterns and all of that is, is something I think that still needs to be addressed properly. Yeah, but thank you for the question, extremely relevant. Thank you. Thank you. So there are questions also in the chat. Um... 
The first one is about the graph uh, the temporal information, basically. So the comment is that the graph encodes patient information, how the temporal information are encoded and trained via back propagation. Temporal information. Um, I'm not quite sure what is meant by the question. Hello, thank you for the very interesting talk. So my question is that yeah. the graph encodes the spatial neighborhood. And uh, so we have some weights and the gra gradients can propagate across these weights during the training. But when the graph is dynamic and it changes over time, mm -hmm. how this temporal information, this change of the graph is being also trained or learned. For so, example, we have a recurrent neural network, LSTM or whatever idea is. So in, in our system, the temporal, so graphs are intrinsically dynamic because the adjacency matrix changes at any given backpropagation pass. It's a, it, the adjacency matrix represents the communication topology um, for any given um, time step. So it means that for any time shot, mm -hmm. uh, we train the network over several epochs, for example, we learn something and then in the next time shot, we update the network again. So a backprop is performed with respect to the adjacency matrix that is currently representing the topology. We make no assumptions about what the adjacency matrix looks looked like before or what it's going to look like next. It's only as it's the, the, the parameter. So it has no are, history. Not in the system. Uh, what you're what you're alluding to is is a very interesting idea. We could potentially um, include some some form of memory or recurrence, but we do not in these systems. Um, doing so might be interesting because then you can start making. Uh, or learning weights that are, or learning interaction strategies that are predictive of how your communication graph might evolve and all of that. But we, we haven't done this in the, in the in the works that I presented to you today. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then there is a comment from a uh, question from Pierrick. Uh, is there a notion of collective memory, for example, in your decentralized path planning approach? Um, right. Good question as well. So here, I think the memory question is with, with respect to the action policy of the agents. So uh, we're actually treating the problem as a sequential decision making problem where a action is taken with respect to a state, no former history. There are, there are absolutely, you could absolutely include um, elements of memory in the system through more complicated um, architectures. Um, and that's definitely interesting, but we, we haven't done it in this, uh, in these couple of works that I presented to you here. Um, we have some other work on, on temporarily partially observable systems where we're looking at memory um, infrastructure, but I, I didn't really speak about this today. But these problems would then be solved um, independently from the graph neural network. So those are separate modules that you would then um, um, basically uh, combine in, 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 in an architecture that would take, take care of both problems. Yeah, I, I, I have a question, Amanda. Thanks for the, the nice presentation. Um, it's a bit related to one of the previous questions. So, so you would train then your, your network for some, some set of graphs, I guess, right? Not for one fixed graph, but you would train it over multiple graphs and then you hope. Because, okay, in, in reality, then when you test it, you might see graphs that have not appeared yet in your training, right? But you seem to be then... Uh, robust against that right so, no, it's so, so what happens memory. actually right so what happens is that um as as we train the agents are executing their policies as they execute their policies they exert motion and right. every time an agent exerts a motion the adjacency matrix changes right so we take snapshots of the agents as they move every snapshot produces a different graph uh, essentially representing the state of the system at that time step. And, and that is essentially what constitutes our data set. So it's the motion of the agents that generates a new adjacency matrix and a new graph topology for every data example that we then consider. Right. And you have to train it on, on, on many different motion uh, setups or many different paths or? Yeah, so so we, we consider like, a concrete example, um, I think in the multi-agent pathfinding um, work that I showed you, we had about, I think, 50,000 um, configurations right. or data examples that we that we trained over. So you start the agent in a given position, you look at where it would move, and that's the yeah. that represents then uh, constitutes our data sample, like data point. Right. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And Amanda, maybe to follow up on that question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you said at the beginning that you have first uh, an image based network, a CNN, and then you have your DNN that would capture the um, the interaction between the robots. So I, I, I couldn't quite understand where the training of the CNN takes place. Is it then a priori and then you have a pre-trained network or does it? Hmm. Yeah, great point. I mean, um, I think, so I can tell you what we did, but I think there are multiple possible um, answers to this. So we actually trained the CNN jointly with the GNN jointly with the MLP. So end to end, one loss, backpropagated uh, with gradients backpropagating through the three modules jointly, right? So that was the um, the, the, the loss function and the setup that I showed you there. Um, nothing precludes you from actually pre-training the, the CNN to some extent and then just fine-tuning it in the system. But what is important to note is um, the role of the CNN in the system, maybe I can actually go to that slide, um, see if I can scroll forwards very quickly. Uh, here we are, here we are. Oops, oh, la, la. overshot a little bit. Um, the role of, of the CNN in the system is actually to produce the what we're calling the interaction feature. So what the CNN outputs is, is the piece of information that is being communicated over, say, wireless, for example, if you're considering robots. So the weights of the CNN determine what an agent is communicating. So it's already part of the communication strategy. And that's why we train it end to end. The GNN in this scenario is, if we look at, if we can, if we compare it with um, this representation here, maybe it becomes even clearer. The F of O here is my CNN, right? It's processing the observation. And the GNN would be my phi. It's processing the incoming information. So that's the analogy. And we're training the weights of F and phi and G at the same time. Okay. Um, Thank hello, you. Professor. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, uh, this is a great job. It inspires me a lot. And I have two questions. Uh, the first question is that uh, in your work, the uh, compressed message is uh, an intermediate product in the whole pipeline. And I'm curious about how to, in, can, how, if we can decode it, the messages and how can we interpret it and compare it with some classical communication protocols? Hmm. This is my first question. Mm -hmm. And second question is, uh, I'm considering a more realistic communication scenarios because hmm. in your work, I think you assumed that uh, the bandwidth is unlimited. And I'm considering if the bandwidth is limited, mm -hmm. that means the output of your first uh, CNN uh, should be out of a limited scale. And I'm right. wondering, given that constraint, how will this uh, influence mm -hmm. the final accuracy of your na uh, yeah. uh, navigation or other tasks? Yeah. And if we can quantify, th that means if we add this constraint, that means there are some priors uh, encoded in your network design and how to quantify its influence mm -hmm. on your final uh, accuracy. Okay, this is my two questions. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So um, you as a designer can decide the size of your feature vector. Actually, if we look at the slide here, and if we assume that Z sub J is the feature that's being communicated over broadcast, you can decide as a designer what the sizes of that feature vector. So as a function of your communication uh, bandwidth constraints, um, you will be able to compress uh, um, Z sub J into the size, like uh, you can decide the size or the amount of, of, of data that is to be transmitted at that point. So the level of compression is completely up to the, to the designer. Um, I, I assume that there is a point after which uh, performance will drop off, but we haven't systematically evaluated for any given problem um, where that drop off point is. Clearly, um, there is a benefit to compressing it a little bit because compression also gives you generalizability. But there is also, on the other hand side, a point after which you compress that much that you're no longer transmitting the relevant information. Um, and that drop off point will be application specific and application dependent. 
Um, your other question was with regards to interpretability, and I think that's a really great question as well, really important. Um, so we do have some work where we've analyzed. Um, so obviously what we're sending here is just numbers, right? They don't represent anything to us, um, Z sub J, right? We have no means of, of introspecting the meaning of this, but you can actually co-train um, in a post hoc manner and um, neural networks that map these feature vectors to, you know, for example, visualizations or, or, or proxy representations for which we do have an interpretation. This, however, assumes that you um, are making a, uh, an assumption about what is being sent because you're, you're deciding what uh, bias you wanna give the neural network that is representing this. Um, and that allows you to then try to understand or interpret the meaning of the messages that is being sent. Um, I, I totally think this is still an open problem and there's no clear methodology yet for how we would go about trying to interpret um, inter-agent communication. Um, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, it, it's more of a, I'd say this is this is currently where the, the frontier of research is in, in differentiable communication among multi-agent systems. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other, um, maybe last question for Amanda? Okay. If not, uh, let me thank Amanda again for this very, very nice talk. And uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank yeah. us your work. And thanks everyone for attending. Uh, and we will keep